May our Lord be with you each and every day, guiding you and directing you, showing the power of his healing hand and, show, and healing you from your sins. Amen. There are there's some things you cannot learn by, from a book. There are some things you can't learn from a teacher. There are things that you cannot learn until you have experienced them yourself. About a year ago, actually a little over a year ago now, I had the privilege to attend our synodical convention in Houston, Texas. For about a week, we went and met together, and we talked about the business of the synod. But during that time, there was what was called these red chair videos. And the theme of the convention was one people forgiven. Each of these red chair videos had a pastor, a district president, or a member of the board of directors of our synod, or even the synod president who sat down. And they shared with us a, a, little, informa- a little time when they had forgiven someone or they'd experienced forgiveness from someone. One of the district presidents, one of the early ones, as he sat down, he had a confession that he shared. He confessed that when he was a pastor many years ago, that he had been called to the bed of a, of a man who was dying. Now this man, it was, he had, been di- he had been, not been in the church for many, many years. And the, the call actually came from his family. The pastor was more than willing to go. So this is not so strange yet, but the fact that when he got there, this man shared with him a little bit about his history. He didn't want a pastor to be there. He didn't want anybody from the church to be there. See, this man had left the church a long time ago because he felt that he had been rejected by the church and rejected by God because he had chosen a lifestyle of homosexuality. And so he decided he did not want to go to a church or follow a God who would reject his lifestyle. This man, he was dying from AIDS. And this was some time ago. And so when the pastor learned this, well, his, his heart, it started beating a little faster. His stomach, it started to do somersaults as it tightened up a little bit. And his throat closed up. And he wasn't sure then if he wanted to reach out his hand and take that man's hand and pray with him because Because he didn't know, and he was afraid. He was afraid that if he touched that man's hand, he may get AIDS himself. But the Lord, he was in that room that day. And that pastor, against his fear and against his judgment, he reached out his hand and he took that man's hand and he prayed with him. But after they prayed, that pastor, he... He was led by the Lord to go a step further and he shared with that man that he, that he had been afraid to touch him, that he'd been afraid to reach out and hold his hand. That pastor shared that, that, he, that it was something that he was concerned about and confessed. And that man forgave him. But the healing continued. Because that man continued by sharing that even though he'd been away from the church for many years, he, had, he knew what he was doing was wrong. He knew that he was a sinner and that, he had, that his lifestyle was not one that God had designed. But he was scared to return to the church. He was scared to return to the church where he'd been rejected, where, he'd been had, where people had turned their back on him. He confessed his anger and his hurt. He confessed his sinfulness. And the Lord healed him not of the disease of AIDS. Shortly thereafter, he died of AIDS. But the Lord healed him of his sinfulness. The Lord called him home to be with him. And, and the pastor, the district president now shared that, that he knew that one day he would see him in heaven. That pastor learned an important lesson that day, didn't he? It was something that you, he couldn't have been taught in a book. Plenty of seminary professors had told them about the importance of touch in a, in a hospital room, but you can't, you can't learn until you've done. And he learned, though, not only about God's forgiveness, but that healing that comes with it. He learned about the healing of his own heart as he dropped down those barriers, those, those things that separated him from reaching out his hand. If you can even imagine for a minute what that pastor was going through. Your stomach tightening or your throat closing. As you find out someone you love has an incurable disease. 
Perhaps you don't pull your hand away, but inside you pull away, you back away, you protect yourself, you put up those walls. You separate yourself because you know the pain is coming. You're scared to touch because if you do, you may experience some of the hurt. If you can relate to this at all, then you can just scratch the surface of what it was like to be a leper in the time of Christ. You can scratch the surface of what it was like to be rejected by your family, by your friends, by those closest to you, to be rejected by your community, those you once ate dinner with, now would, couldn't stand to be in the same room with you, breathing the same air, those you once embraced, didn't want you within ten feet of them. A leper truly had a lifestyle of loss. Perhaps they were not immediately going to die. But many of them, I'm sure, wish that they would. Because the normal people, well, they thought if a, if a leper got close enough to them, they, could, they would be allowed to throw rocks at them to keep them away. And this is where we pick up with Naaman. Because here we have Naaman, a man who is desperate. A man who fears that he will never again take his wife in his arm and kiss her on the cheek. A man who knows that he may never again reach out his arms and pull his children in in a bear hug. A man who instead of sharing stories about triumphs in battle with his fellow mighty men of valor, will now share stories of rejection and solitude with those who are afflicted with the same disease. He was desperate. He was desperate for anything that could bring him healing. He was desperate to be set free from this this life-altering, this life-destroying disease. And so he was willing to hear the words of a slave girl. He was willing to hear the words of a little girl who he had captured in battle. She was not even of his household. She may later have been trained and bred and raised up and even sent and sold to another household, but in this case, her words were the most important words he heard. Because her words were those to encourage him to go to see Elisha. Now when we understand the context, it starts to add on to things, add on to why it was so hard for him to go. Because to cross the line, to step over into Israel, meant going into the land of his enemy. See, as a, the commander of the army, he probably had a number of Israelites' heads on his hands, their blood on his hands. He probably had many Israelites who disliked him, maybe even hated him. But he was desperate. He was willing to go, to take the step, to go to see a prophet who he didn't know and ask for healing. And you can see the desperation he had because he puts together literally a treasure, maybe even his entire life savings, 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 sets of clothing. This is probably all that he had, willing to trade for life, willing to trade for another chance to grab hold of his sons or daughters. He was desperate. And so he went. He crossed the line. He entered into the land of his enemies. He entered into the land of the one true God, Yahweh. Keep in mind, he didn't believe in Yahweh at this point. He didn't believe in the true God. He believed in his false gods, probably Baal, a god of rock or a god of metal who couldn't do anything for him. Before he even spoke to Elisha, though, Elisha sent messengers to him. And Elisha sent those messengers and he said, go dip into the river seven times and you will be healed. But what was his response? Apparently he was not so desperate because of when, he was, when he heard that he said, no! And he was infuriated. He wanted nothing to do with that. He's not going to jump into the stinky old Jordan River where the flies fly above it and it kind of stinks a little bit. And those unclean people, the Israelites, wash. But the Lord changed his heart, didn't he? Through another servant, his heart was changed and he went and he bathed and he was clean. He was washed and he was made new. A Gentile. Someone outside of the kingdom of God washed, cleansed from that leprosy 
that life-altering disease, the hope was returned. Now this shouldn't surprise any of us. Not if we've ever read Luther's small catechism, because we know that right as soon as we read about holy baptism, we hear the words, God's holy word and water bring healing. Simple water and the word brought healing to Naaman. Simple water and the word washed away that leprosy. Simple water and the word has washed away our sins. Every time we see a child, an adult, any person who comes to the waters of holy baptism, we know that that child is not only healed by that water, but by the water and God's word coming together and washing away our sins. Bringing healing, not externally, but healing of our hearts. Healing in our lives. And we know that that healing was so necessary for each one of us. Because we know that without that healing, we were the outcasts. We were the ones outside of God's kingdom. We were those who were unwilling to stretch out a hand and help another in need. But through the waters of baptism, we have been washed and made new. The old Adam, the old Eve, was drowned and killed. The old Adam and the old Eve was washed away. But we know that even still we, st- keep, need- we keep needing that healing. We keep seeking that healing because we know that there's constantly a battle in us. Well, that old Adam and old Eve has been washed away. There's still that battle of sin in our hearts. And so each day we seek again the healing that comes from God, which He so lavishly gives to us which He so willingly pours out because of the blood of Christ, which He so openly offers to us in His love. And He invites us to offer to others. He invites us to offer that hand, not to someone who is dying of leprosy, not to the person who is dying of AIDS or HIV, but to offer a person, offer that hand to a person who is dying from sin. Because it not it sin that robs us of our Christian family? Isn't it sin that has entered into our lives and destroyed the full trust we have in God? Isn't it sin that has ripped us apart physically, emotionally, and spiritually? And isn't it sin that takes and destroys people who do not know the healing power of God? We we're desperate. There are many who are desperate who need that healing. There are many who are in desperation to experience the power of that simple water and God's Word, holy baptism. For in holy baptism, that healing will come. That healing that will take outcasts, lepers, and welcome them into the family of the Lord. But that healing is not only reserved for us here on earth, is it? That healing is only begun here on earth. That healing that we can't see, that we can't touch. That healing that doesn't restore our, our limbs to make us strong again as we age. The healing that doesn't restore our sight or our hearing. The healing, it doesn't make us have the strength and energy we once did. But that healing is one that is preparing us for the eternal healing of God which will. For God tells us that on the last day, those who have been baptized and believe in Him, that we will be brought into His kingdom. That we will be raised up from these bodies broken by sin, destroyed by death. That we will be raised up and we will be brought into His kingdom. That when He destroys this heaven and this earth, that He will again rebuild a new one. And when He rebuilds a new one, He will give us new bodies. Not bodies like we currently have, as Paul refers to as tents, but permanent structures, permanent bodies that will be fully formed without blemish, without pain, without death and without sin. Bodies that will never again feel the ache and and pain that we feel on this earth. And that is the promised hope that is reserved for each of God's people who have experienced the power of simple water and His Word. That is the promise reserved for each one of us, His children who have been brought into His family, who have been taken from death to life.
And that is the promise that Christ so willingly gave His life for us on the cross. So that each of us, well dead, could be made alive. Not here only on this earth, but eternally in heaven. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, through this life we know that we will suffer many diseases. We will suffer many pains. We will suffer sickness and death. We know that we'll fe- suffer from pain and emotionally and spiritually. But that you have the power to heal. That your hand, O oh Lord, is mighty to save. And that you, through, your, through holy baptism, have promised us life's lives of healing. Lives of joy and lives of comfort. We pray, Lord, that each day as we are on this earth, that we would look forward with hope to that day, that last day, when we will be with you, when we will be set free from the pains of this life and celebrate in the joy of the next. Lord, may we see the desperation and the need of those Gentiles, those who are outside of your kingdom. May we see the need and be willing to reach out a hand take hold of their hand and pray with them and share the love that you have shown to us. Fill our hearts with that urgency that you are coming again quickly. The urgency that we, as your children, have an opportunity and responsibility to share that love, to bring that peace and that hope. This we pray through Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.